and I struck the match and I threw it into the furnace. Uh, the natural gas blew up in my face, actually threw me across the hallway, and um, then it was dark again. And my mind began to shut down. I began to hear ringing in my ears. And I, you know, I enjoyed swimming underwater, so I knew that that was a sign of oxygen deprivation. And I knew that I only had a little time left. And so as my brain shut down, I looked down uh, and I saw my body on the floor in the couch cushions. I said, I'm not healed. I'm dead. And I stood up to face whatever this thing was, and then right through the wall of my living room walked two creatures, and they had talons on both, all 20 digits, the fingers and the toes, and they were carrying in their hands manacles. Both of them had a set of manacles. They looked like a gray metal, and they were very big and very heavy. And they showed me hell. It was awful. It was horrible. It was chaotic. It was incredible suffering, just beyond language to describe. And you're at the mercy of these creatures, which hate you with an absolute passion. Christ was standing right to my left. I, my first thought was, uh, you guys aren't going to get very far because Jesus is right here uh, and he's going to protect me. But he didn't say a word and he didn't make a move and they kept on coming. They kept on coming. They kept on coming. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. My guest today is Carl. Carl died and thought he was going to hell when demons converged on his body. Then Jesus showed up and took him out of the gates of hell, but asked him this ultimate question. Find out what the question was. You don't want to miss this. Carl, thank you for being with me today. Julie, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to share my testimony with you and your audience. Well, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you, and we are excited to hear your powerful testimony. So why don't you start with the year 1978, where it all began? So 1978 was the year that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Um, and it began with C.S. Lewis, an awesome author. I still enjoy reading his works. But I got a copy of a book called Caught Up Into Paradise uh, by Dr. Richard Eby. And this was not the first near-death experience I had read, but it was really the first Christian um, near-death experience I'd read, and it put a whole new perspective on it. And one of the things in the book was God, while he was um, talking with Dr. Eby, offered to answer any question he asked. I thought, wow, what an opportunity. And I read the book and uh, appreciated the testimony and the questions. But when I was done reading, I said, really? Um, this is a doctor, and he's a Christian. And the questions he answered were so basic. I felt even as a new Christian, I could have answered those myself just from reading the scriptures or from church history or from general theology. And I said to myself, well, if I ever had a chance like that, I would want to do a lot better. So not knowing uh, that I would ever have a chance, I still created a list of questions I thought would have been more appropriate to ask if I had an opportunity like that. And so I created that list and it was very basic. And I went on from there with my college education and continued my uh, Christian growth. There was a, a and I'm, I'm not pronounce his last name right, but his first name was Dave. And Dave was what I like to call a Jesus person. There are not very many of these around, but they are just sold out for Jesus. And he was on target because one of the things he said to me uh, literally saved me from eternity in hell. And he said to me one little phrase, and I will get to it later. Uh, when I tell you what happened with the demons. So uh, fast forward now to 1995. Um, I was graduated. I'd been working for some years. I was married. I started a family. We had a house. and um, But I was in East Texas, and the economy was not terribly good at the time. So I was kind of bumping around from contract job to contract job. And at that time in the winter of 95, I was out of work. And that was when the old furnace in our uh, house that we bought uh, failed. And basically what happened was that the pilot light would tend to go out. And it was an older model that didn't have the usual safety feature that almost all furnaces have today, where if the pilot light goes out, the furnace will not operate. Well, this one, when the pilot light was out, we continued to try to heat the house by putting gas to the burners. And without a pilot light, of course, the gas would not ignite. And instead of warming the house, it filled it with natural gas. Very dangerous. 
uh, but I had no money to buy spare parts. So I tinkered with it as best I could. And I would get it working for a while, and then it would stop working for a while. And this went on for several weeks, and I was really hoping I could find a job so I could get some money and fix this properly. And then uh, I was only like a couple of weeks away from that when uh, one night <clears throat> uh, the furnace had failed multiple times. I lost count. It was probably about 3 a.m. in the morning, and it failed again. I was really sleepy and probably groggy from gas. And I got out of bed. I didn't bother even to turn the light on. I just felt my way down the hallway and I opened up the furnace cabinet and opened up the front of the furnace and a thought came to me and the thought was, eh, if I just throw a match in there, it'll light. I won't have to go through all this tedium because before that, I would uh, shut off the gas, uh, relight the pilot light, or sorry, shut off the gas, turn on the exhaust, make sure that the house was clear of all fumes. And then I would... Uh, relight the pilot light, make sure it was burning steadily. Then I would turn on the gas and then I would watch it for a little while. And then I would shut everything up and go to bed. Uh, I, was, I, I don't know how many times I did. I said, I had enough of this. So I just took a match and was one of those strike anywhere matches and a box of matches. And I struck the match and I threw it into the furnace. Well, um, it's predictable what happened there. Uh, the natural gas blew up in my face, actually threw me across the hallway. And um, then it was dark again. Well, I didn't feel any pain at the moment. So um, I thought, oh, well, I guess I got off lucky. But I better go to the bathroom and see what I've done to myself because I figured I'd got some singed eyebrows or something. Well, I went to the bathroom and I turned on the light. And as soon as the light turned on and my eyes focused on the mirror, I saw I had really damaged myself badly. I, my eyebrows were completely gone. The uh, hair... Um, around my face was all singed and everything was red and then I looked at my uh, right hand and it was red all the way up to the elbow because that's where my pajama sleeve ended and then um, this part of my hand here was charred like third degree burns um, and I'll, I'll tell you about later how that got healed because I still have a little tiny scar right about um, there I don't know if you can see it or not that's the only scar that I have left from that really awful burn and the pain was horrible. I thrust my hand under the faucet and tried to chill it with cold water and that that didn't do anything for me. So the next few days were very difficult for me. Um, I didn't have money for a doctor's visit or even buying any kind of uh, pain medication or burn cream or anything. So I just took antihistamines, which I had in there, and I soaked my hand in cold water. And um, it got worse because uh, rust had been blasted into my eyes by the fire because the burners were very old and rusty. And this caused an infection in my eyes so that it uh, began to fill with pus and I could, couldn't even see. And the flames had gone in my mouth, down my throat, into my lungs. It also had gone up my nose as well. And so my throat became infected and was extremely painful. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. Um, even swallowing my own saliva was agony. Um, and but I couldn't, there wasn't anything to do. I, I had just been employed, so I wasn't um, eligible for government benefits. And so I just toughed it out. There was, that was all to do. I had a wife and two children at the time to support. And I thought I need to get better and get back to work and um, not die. And that, was, that was my plan. It wasn't a good one. So I was in such pain that I couldn't sleep. So I would thrash around in bed and just to give my mother, my children a break. I moved to the couch in the living room at night, which actually prolonged my life because uh, I developed pneumonia and my lungs were seeking fluid and the fluid began to collect in the bottom of my lungs. But as long as I was upright, I was relatively OK because the couch was too short. I'm, a, I'm about six foot four. And that couch was nowhere near that. So I just kind of propped myself up on the arm and I would try to sleep sitting up. Uh, that didn't work very well. But I got desperate for sleep. The third night, I hadn't slept. I hadn't eaten. I hardly drank anything. I was hungry, thirsty, and mortally tired. And I thought, I've got to lie down. Where can I lie down? There wasn't any other, there were no guest room in the house. So I took the, pulled the cushions off the couch and I laid them out on the floor. And I thought, I will just lie down here on the floor. And try to get some sleep and so i lay down on the floor on the couch cushions and that was my big mistake because when i did that 
the fluid, which had been down in my lungs, now came up, and I found I couldn't breathe. I couldn't mm. even talk. In fact, I couldn't even move because I, I, I'd forgotten my bowl of ice water for my hand. And when I got up, tried to get up to go get that bowl of ice water, I couldn't move. And then I found I couldn't breathe. And then I couldn't even speak. Uh, it was like I was just nailed to the floor and unable to breathe. And I realized this is not good. Um, I turned off all the lights in the house. It was like midnight. Everybody was asleep in their bedrooms. And uh, I was suffocating. I knew I had five or six minutes before I would lose consciousness and another five or six minutes before I would be brain dead. And that was very frightening. Um, I couldn't call for help. I couldn't help myself. Um, and I realized in a moment that the only option I now had was to pray to God for help. And so I began to pray. And, you know, I was, you know, by then I'd been a Christian for uh, about 17 years or so. And the um, I taught uh, Bible classes, so and I taught on prayer. I knew how to pray. So I prayed, and I prayed really good prayers, um, and nothing happened. And my mind began to shut down. I began to hear ringing in my ears. And I, you know, I enjoyed swimming underwater. So I knew that that was a sign of oxygen deprivation. And I knew that I only had a little time left. And so as my brain shut down and my prayers became limited, I um, realized I needed to come up with a prayer that would be effective. And the best thing I could come up with was one last word. As my mind shut down, I thought of one last word. And that was help. And behind it, I put the intention that I would accept help from God on any terms he was going to give me. And as soon as I prayed that prayer, my pain disappeared. <clears throat> and the burn pain not only disappeared, but I, um, I was born with scoliosis. And so that always gives me a low-grade pain in my back. And so even that was gone. And the hunger and the thirst was gone. And, and I stood up in the room and I looked around. And I was amazed because even though the lights were off, the room appeared to be brightly lit, but there were no shadows. And I thought, well, that's really strange. Um, but I thought, I'm healed. And not only healed, I'm miraculously, amazingly healed because now I can see in the dark. And I took a breath, so to speak, and I could smell. And now when I had been in undergraduate school, I had a really bad case of the flu and that caused me to lose most of my sense of smell. Um, so, but now I could smell things I'd never smelled before, and I could discern the things I couldn't. I didn't even. I didn't even know I'd smelled before. I could tell I was smelling the paint on the wall. I could tell I was smelling the paper in the books. Um, I could tell I was smelling the fabric on the couch, and I knew what those smells were. You know, I'd never smelled them before. I thought, wow, my smell is sense of smell is really good, and my hearing was amazing. Um, I listened carefully, and I heard trucks going by. Well, the only street, um, the nearest street that trucks were allowed to go on was five blocks away. You could never hear that normally in the house. And here I was hearing it very plainly. And my uh, sight was amazing. I looked um, at the, out the window, and I could see in the dark across the street to my neighbor's yard. And <clears throat> focusing near I looked at these window screens and I could focus down and see the individual wires in the screen and I could see flakes of corrosion on those wires. And then I looked across the street and I could see my neighbor's lawn. I could see individual blades of grass. I looked between the blades of grass. I could see the granules of dirt in my neighbor's yard across the street at midnight in the dark. And I thought, wow, praise the Lord, I'm healed. And then I looked down. Uh, and I saw my body on the floor in my couch cushions. I said, I'm not healed. I'm dead. This is not good. Well, uh, as an engineer, I'm a problem solver, and I had read near-death experiences before, and I heard about people who had died and come back, and I said, I've got to come back. Um, but uh, I need help. So first I thought, maybe I can go wake up one of the family and bring them to, to see my to look see the body and then you know call for an ambulance or something so i i the nearest bedroom was my daughter alex's bedroom and so i walked out of the living room down the hallway and went to open her door and when i tried to grab the doorknob door handle my hand went right through the handle i said oh i can't open the door i said 
if my hand could go through the handle, I can go through the door. I walked right through that door. And it was an interesting sensation because um, as I passed through the door, uh, my sight became occluded. That is, inside the door, I couldn't see. So inside the solid door, I, I could not see. But as soon as I emerged on the other side of the door, I could see again. And again, my daughter's room with the lights off looked like it was fully lit, but no shadows. And as I passed through the door, it had an interesting sensation. It felt like I was passing through a falling stream of cool sand. So it was like pressure on me. And it felt cool to my um, spiritual body. And I got through the uh, door and I went over to my daughter's bed and I said, Alex, wake up. I need to talk to you. And she couldn't hear a word I said. I could not make any sound to wake her up. So I, I tried to um, push on her shoulder and tap her on the head and my hand went right through her. Uh, and she didn't even move. So I thought, mm. oh, this is not good. I need help. So I thought, I'll try my I'll try my son. Well, his bedroom was right next to hers. And the shortest distance there was through the wall. There's a closet uh, back there. The closets were back to back with a wall in between. And I thought, all right. Um, well, actually, no, his closet and her closet are right and left. So I went into her closet, walked right through her clothes, went through the wall into my son's bedroom. There he was lying in his bed. I went over, tried to wake him up. No dice, uh, no success there. And so um, I realized, uh, you know, time is passing. I've got to do something and I can't wake up anybody else. So I've got to do this myself. So I went back out into the hallway through his door and I could have just gone straight through her bedroom and gone back to the living room. But I was still thinking in my normal mode. So I went, walked down the hallway, went to the living room and I, I crouched down by the body and I was looking at it and saying, all right, where's the damage and what can I do about it? And just about that time when I was thinking about what to do, how, how to get my body into my body and get my body working again, I had this sensation of evil. You know, if you if you watch like a horror movie, and I don't like horror movies, but if you watch one, they often the mood, the, the mood of the movie will be uh, set by the tempo of the music and it'll be in, like in the dark so your main character's in the dark somewhere and you think something evil's about to jump out of the dark at them and the hair on your back, the back of your neck starts to go up. Well, that is the kind of evil premonition I had right then. And uh, when I felt that, I thought it was evil and there was hatred in it. And I stood up to face where it was coming at me through the southwest corner of the living room. And I stood up to face whatever this thing was. And then right through the wall of my living room walked two creatures and uh, so I've given you an illustration of what they looked like, but they were about man sized, uh, but they were not human beings. Um, they were not wearing clothes, but they were covered in short black fur. And they had talons on both all 20 digits, the fingers and the toes. Uh, they had no genitalia. Um, they had pointed ears and a very uh, prominent feature about them was their eyes were solid yellow. and um, they, as they came, they were laughing at me. And uh, as they opened their mouths, I could see short white fangs, upper and lower, and red, bright red tongues. Um, and the other thing that was remarkable about them is they looked very muscular, but they also looked very underfed. Uh, like they had been um, worked very hard, but they had also not been properly nourished. And they were carrying in their hands manacles. Both of them had a set of manacles. They looked like a gray metal, and they were very big and very heavy. And they were, as they came to me, suddenly um, I could understand their thoughts as if they projected their thoughts at me. Now, this is in, in the spirit realm. Um, speech doesn't seem to work, at least as far as I tried it. But uh, you could communicate mind to mind. And I presume that was telepathy. Um, I'd actually experimented with that before as a teenager, but that's another story. So I, I did understand and did believe in telepathy and actually had used it. So these creatures communicated by telepathy. And it wasn't just thoughts. It was images. It was emotions. It was feelings. It was a whole range of um, information, a whole spectrum of information. And it was in the blink of an eye, but it was huge amount of information. And one of the things that they uh, imparted to me was images of hell. And they, they explained to me that they, um, they were here to take my soul they consider to me not as a human being with thoughts, emotions, and purpose, but simply as food and fuel for their purposes. And they, they I was their prey, and they were about to capture me, and they had me. Um, 
and they showed me hell. It was awful. It was horrible. It was chaotic. It was incredible suffering, just beyond language to describe hunger, thirst, pain. Um, and you're at the mercy of these creatures which hate you with an absolute passion, and they will torment you. And because uh, in the tormenting of the human soul, they extract the um, energy or whatever, or whatever it is they consider to be food or fuel from you through tormenting. So they have no reason to hold back on any torment, and they will torment you to the maximum degree. And they were evil creatures, chaotic, um, malevolent, uh, and just... Um, but they were also powerful. I could sense that these things could handle me like a, like a dog would handle a kitten. Um, so there wasn't any uh, obvious way to resist them. Um, and I protested. I said, I'm a Christian. I'm baptized. I'm, I confess Christ as my Savior. I'm born again. Da, da, da. I go to church and I give tithes. And all the things the church had taught me uh, were criteria for salvation. And they laughed. I thought that was funny. Um, they said that they had always, they'd been with me my entire life and they had been trying to kill me since birth. And really, I, I could tell you stories about how many times I escaped death by just a margin. I've got lots of scars to show it was closer than most people would like. Um, but they, uh, they said they had me because I had sinned and I had not dealt with my sins. And then they rattled off this enormous list of Sins I had never properly dealt with, things the church had taught me were inconsequential. Right. I, I, some of the things that amazed me that uh, were sufficient to send me to hell were like just being cross with the cashier in the supermarket because she was processing the order too slow. I mean, that's not love. Um, and other things, I had, um, I had been let out of a rental contract uh, by a roommate when I got married and had to get my own place. Well, I had made a promise to pay the the rent every month for the full term of the contract. And just because he had uh, verbally let me out of the contract was not good enough. No, I was supposed to pay uh, every month's rent on that thing to the end of the lease, even though I had moved out and he had gotten another roommate and he didn't lose any money. <clears throat> and there were things like that, little things I'd stolen that I thought were inconsequential. But uh, the, the main point here is um, they had me, I had sinned. Um, and that uh, the, the little tricks that the church had taught me were useless at that point. Well, they were almost on me, and I thought to myself, I don't want to go to hell, um, but I'm not saved. What am I going to do? And I, I, in that state, my mind worked at an incredible level. I could remember every detail of my life from conception all the way to that moment in incredible detail, because if I had just glanced at a person's face, I could tell you just like that how many eyelashes they had. Uh, it was that detailed. I could remember every day of my life, everything I'd done, every thought I'd had, every word that was spoken to me. And I could review the entire history of my life in a fraction of a second. Um, the, the mind of the, and the spirit is just phenomenal, amazing. So I reviewed my life. I said, I've got to find something, some way I'm going to get out of this. And that's when I got back to the Plainsboro Gospel Fellowship. And, and a fellow Dave who uh, told me this one thing that meant all the difference here. He said, if you ever meet a demon, rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, they, they were just like were almost in my face when I, I, I got to that part. And I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it was like a wrecking ball hit them. And they were thrown right out of the room, out of the house. And they, I didn't see them anymore. And so there I was back in my living room looking down at my dead body, my corpse, and thinking, wow, I really need to get my body going now because I am lost. And I thought, um, this is not good because I'm not going to heaven and I don't want to go to hell. And I thought, well, I don't want to wander around as a disembodied spirit until the judgment day because there may be other perils out here because the spirit outside the body is very vulnerable. And I was desperate to get back in my body, so I knelt down by my body on the floor and I was again examining um, the body and I was thinking I've got to get this thing going and where do I start and I, I kind of reached down into the chest to, to feel around to see what I could do there and right then I began to have another sensation it was like the one where the evil came in from the southwest and this time it was coming from the um, southeast corner but this time it wasn't evil it was good Incredible purity, love, um, holiness. 
something really wonderful was approaching my house. And this time I stood up and I was facing now towards my front door and wondering what is happening now. And then right through my front door walks Jesus Christ. And um, the first thing he communicated to me, and I can, there was no speech at all in any of this experience. It was all mind to mind. Um, he's, he let me know that his appearance was not his real appearance, but he was appearing to me uh, as I would expect to uh, see him so that I would recognize him. And the way he appeared to me was a man of about a little more than average height, maybe about 5'10". He had um, long, uh, dark brown hair that was shoulder length. Uh, he was dressed in a white tunic, and he had a blue robe that was thrown over one shoulder. And he was wearing brown leather sandals, and his, his hands were empty. And he, um, as he approached me, he, want, he reassured me with something that meant a whole lot to me. He, he was aware that the demons had been there and that they had accused me of all those many sins. And he said he knew all about that. He knew everything about me, and he still loved me unconditionally. And that was really what I needed to hear right then. The next thing he, he by that time, he was in the living room, and we were pretty much face to face. And... The uh, next thing he let me know is he was disappointed in me because um, I had had so much uh, purpose in this life and I had really accomplished none of it. Um, he said that uh, because I had invoked his name, uh, that that was sufficient for me to go to heaven at that point. But uh, I had accomplished nothing of any merit in this life. And so I would go to heaven as the least of saints. Um, basically with no rank, no reward, just eternal life, which was certainly much better than hell. But I was shocked because uh, <clears throat> I had been a model church member. I had done everything they had told me to do. And mm -hmm. he didn't explain why I had not met the criteria, but I later figured out that it was wrong motives. So well, what you do um, is not as important as why you do it. What is your motivation for it? I had done it out of duty. Now, when Christ was talking to Peter and he asked Peter, do you love me? Uh, Peter used the word phylos, brotherly love. But Jesus used the word agape, which is selfless, unconditional love. Um, and I wasn't even in that category. I was doing it out of pragma, which means duty. I was doing it to get out of hell, uh, to get into heaven, um, and to get a, a reward. And I didn't love God. I didn't love my fellow man. I even had a hard time loving myself. And so I was like the um, the people that Jesus refers to in uh, Matthew 7, 23, when they say, you know, Lord, we have done mighty works in your name, miracles, signs and wonders. And he said to them, depart from me. I never knew you. And it took me a long time to figure out from that verse uh, what was actually going on there. And what it was is those people believed in Jesus Christ, but they were using his name, his authority, his power to build their own kingdom. And for that reason, he never knew them. Why? And the new, the word that they use for new there is the same word that uh, the scriptures use for when a husband knows his wife. It's an intimate relationship. I had no relationship with him. And that's uh, where I had really failed. So they, um, no, I wasn't saved, and the church had taught me I was, and I wasn't. But anyway, Christ was willing to give me a break. But um, he uh, he said that uh, there was another option. Mm. And, uh, he said that if you don't come back to this life, your children aren't going to make it. They're going to go to hell. And so um, I can uh, resurrect your body and put you back into this life so you can raise your children right. But two things that were very important there. Uh, one, I couldn't pull that uh, verse, you know, I couldn't do that again, what I had just done, basically saying to the, the invoking his name and therefore getting out of hell and, and getting saved because he wasn't going to accept that a second time. He, I know 
he just explained to me that I should know better and he expected better from me. He said, if I go back to this life and I fail to get it right the second time, I could still go to hell. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a tough question for me because I was actually terrified of hell. I did not want to go there. I wasn't too thrilled about going to heaven as the least of saints. Uh, but the two deciding factors for me was one, I love my children. I wouldn't want my worst enemy to go to hell and I couldn't, couldn't see them going to hell. So I was willing to risk hell myself to come back for their sake. And the other thing was I could tell that that's what he wanted. And, um, I, I knew enough at that point that whatever God wants is what you really need to be doing. So because he wanted it, because my children were in peril, um, I agreed to come back. So the next thing Christ explained to me was um, when Father God had made my spirit man, and that's the combination of the spirit, which is part of God, uh, literally a piece of God, uh, and the soul, which is where our personality are, uh, is uh, put. That's our mind, will, and emotions, they say. It's also a number of other things. Um, and he puts the soul and the spirit together to make what I call our spirit man. And that's what I was in that state. Uh, when the Father God created me, he put that gift of healing in me even before I was born. Yeah. Every Christian should be able to minister healing. So I think that that gift is already in everyone from the very beginning. And as the person becomes Christian, a Christian, they receive the Holy Spirit and um, the power to use that gift. So he, he told me that I would actually heal my own body. <clears throat> and um, he asked me, Will I, do I want to do that? Of course I want to do that. Yes, yes, immediately. Um, and as soon as I agreed to that, the whole scenario changed. Um, we were no longer in my living room, but I was standing with Jesus on the bank of a very broad, flat, uh, muddy river. And um, I think this was a vision because I don't think we were actually transported to a physical location, but for some reason to, to minister the healing, he had to take me to a, a vision. And because there were papyrus reeds, I recognized those right away, growing along the banks of the river, I presumed this was supposed to be the Nile. And I looked around further and I saw some people. There was a, a woman working in a nearby field and there was a man fishing on the river. And they were short, um, dark people with almost jet black hair and they were wearing ancient uh, style clothing, much like the ancient Egyptians. So uh, it wasn't explained to me, but I figured this is, the scenario has got to be ancient Egypt. Well, there was a bundle of papyrus reeds, some tools and some, uh, some lumber that were uh, already staged on the bank of the river, and Christ told me he wanted me to build a reed boat. And an image in my mind appeared of a kind of a canoe-shaped papyrus boat, and it, I, I looked it up later, and I found out yeah, that there were uh, ancient examples of these boats that were built. And uh, he told me to build that, and so I built it. And what tells me this is not a dream, but a vision, is that in my normal dreaming states, Whenever I attempt to do anything, everything is always kind of foggy and nebulous and things shift. And it's very difficult to complete any task uh, in order uh, in, in my dreaming state. Uh, but in this vision, everything went together just incredibly fast, incredibly easy. And within um, like moments, I had this boat built and I pushed into the water and then there was a pole there uh, for guiding the boat. And Christ stepped into the boat first, and then I stepped in and I pushed off from the bank of the river. And then he pointed down the river, and I presume this is the Nile, so I'm pointing down the river. And just a little ways down the river was a long, low island. Um, it, was, it was just just a just a, a foot or so higher than the, than the level of the water, and it had some rocks on it and some small bushes and small trees, uh, but it was mostly bare dirt. But what's remarkable about the island was superimposed on the island was an image of my prone body lying there. And it was um, like the old invisible man model. So the, the skin was transparent. And you could see through the skin to the skeleton and the muscles and the organs. And most of them were also, I'd say, translucent because you could, you could see through them, but you couldn't see clearly what was on the other side. Uh, 
And then when I looked closer, I realized that the organs that had been damaged in the explosion were different colors. Um, the eyes were like a sooty black, charcoal colored. The throat was bright red. The lungs were a mottled green. Um, mm. But what puzzled me too was that uh, I told you before my, my back uh, is, has scoliosis. That was clear. Um, that was not, uh, didn't show up as being um, damaged or injured or ill. So it was just the injuries that you sustained from the fire. Right. So there were three, th the, and my hand also. So the hand, the four things. Uh, the the hand was kind of a reddish color, and it was where it was badly burned. It was dark brown and even whitish, right at the very uh, dark burn. So as we came down towards the island, he told me he wanted me to reach out and touch the damaged organs. And as I touched them, they would be healed. Um, and I was trying to comprehend all this and digest this, and we were moving a little faster than I um, I could really re respond to. And so we actually passed the head uh, and the eyes before I understood what was expected of me. And then I reached out and I touched the throat. My hand went into the body and touched the throat. And it was interesting because this body was huge. It was, um, it was like 20 feet uh, high from the back to the top of the chest and must have been a uh, hundred yards or more long. Um, but as even though I was, uh, you know, my normal size as it reached out, it's almost like my arm extended past me and into the body, like it, uh, like it could stretch like rubber. Um, uh, distance was not uh, an impediment there. And as I touched the throat, the red color disappeared and it became clear. And then as we went down past the lungs, I reached out, touched the lungs, and they became clear. And as we passed the hand, it became clear. And then we got to the foot of the island. And I realized I'm going to have to turn around, go upstream to the head and finish the uh, process of healing the body. Well, as soon as I got to the foot of the island, uh, that vision was interrupted. And I found myself and Christ back in my living room. Um, and we were standing there looking down at my body and was like, what is going on here? Why did the uh, vision get interrupted before I could uh, heal the eyes? And then I felt that evil presence again. And that's when those two demons came right back through the same uh, wall of the living room that they came and entered in before. And they were carrying the manacles. Only this time they weren't laughing. They weren't talking. They were communicating to me. They were just charging right at me uh, as if they're going to make another attempt to capture me. Wow. Well, Christ was standing right to my left. I, my first thought was, uh, you guys aren't going to get very far because... Jesus is right here, uh, and he's going to protect me. But he didn't say a word, and he didn't make a move, and they kept on coming. Uh, then I realized that Jesus was not going to intervene. And I realized i got to do something, and the only thing I could think of in that tiny fraction of a moment was to do exactly what I did before, and I, and I rebuked them. I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. They were knocked out of the room, and I didn't see them again uh, for the rest of that um uh, near-death experience. And I, was I like, think it's interesting, Carl, that they wanted to come get you before your healing was complete. Right. They wanted to come and get me healing to complete. And they were not at all afraid of attacking me with Jesus right there. And mm -hmm. I was like, Lord, um, is there something I need to know here? Because I really expected him to protect me. Uh, if, if I hadn't rebuked them, and I hadn't done it before they got hold of me, I think if they would have got those manacles on me and taken me to hell. I would have spent eternity in hell. And that was shocking. It took me a long, long time to figure out what that was about. But I do have the answer. I did figure it out. It took me like almost 20 years. So um, what it is, it goes back to the charter of the church. When Christ uh, sent out his disciples. He gave them five missions in the charter of the church. And if you, it's in Matthew. And he said, he sent them out to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse lepers, and preach the gospel. All right. So that is a mission. That is the task that to Christ, who takes his direction from the Father, delegated to the church, to the Christians. So. It's the Christian's responsibility 
to cast out demons, not Jesus's. He can do it. He did it when he was down here, but he's not here anymore. And he has delegated that to the church. So anything in those five missions, that is the charter of the church, there are five missions. Anything in that charter, any one of those five missions, he expects us to do in his authority and his power. That's why he left it up to me to rebuke the demons. And that's why he didn't interfere. The demons, they knew that. They knew that uh, he would not interfere, even if my very soul was in danger, because that is authority, that is power he's given to us to exercise. And he fully expects us to know who he is, who we are, and who our enemy is. And we need to know the rules of engagement. That is one of the most important rules of engagement. God will not do for us what he's given us to do for ourselves. Um, and that has cost millions and millions of Christians uh, their eternal salvation um, because they didn't know what they were supposed to do at that moment. And uh, I thank God that I figured it out with uh, the help of the uh, Jesus people who told me the truth and prepared me for that moment because I wouldn't be here. I wasn't, that hadn't happened. So the demons were gone. Uh, and as soon as uh, they were gone, the vision resumed itself. I found myself back in the pirate's boat, at the foot of the island, at the foot of my uh, body. I pulled the boat back up to the head. I reached out, touched the eyes. They became clear. <clears throat> And as soon as that happened, the vision stopped, and I found myself back in the living room. And uh, Jesus was now standing in the uh, foyer, and he was about to leave. And he said, well, it's time for you to go back in your body. And um, it was right then that I remembered my list. Oh, how I wanted to ask that list. But, um, you know, Christ hadn't offered to answer any questions like the father had offered um, Dr. Eby. And he had just saved me from hell. He had just showed me how to heal my body. He was about to resurrect me, and he didn't owe me a thing. I could not frame the question, um, please answer my questions. You know, when we're, when we're in this realm, in our bodies, and we think, oh, if I was in God's presence, I could corner him, and I would demand answers to these questions, and I wouldn't let off until he... Um, answered every one of them to my satisfaction. Well, it doesn't work like that there. No, no, no. Christ is awesome. He is incredible and he is terrible. He is truly terrifying. I could sense in his power that with a thought he could annihilate me, just a thought in an instant. And to be in the presence of that power and, and that incredible personality and that holiness and that purity uh, and that authority, I... Couldn't, I couldn't come to answer that, ask that question. I was thinking to myself, well, I got no way to frame this question, so I'll just go back to life and um, figure this out myself. I don't. He doesn't owe me anything. I, he, it's, it's not important, um, not important enough to jeopardize this situation here. But what I didn't realize was that he knows our every thought. He could read my mind. He knew exactly what I was thinking. Mm. He thought, his thought came to me. He said, Carl, would you like the answers to my list of questions? Oh, I had no idea what that was about. I had, I had no clue what his list of questions were. And the only thing I could think of was, whatever his list of questions is, it's got to be better than mine. And as desperately as I wanted my list of questions answered, I said, Lord, I do want to know the answers to your list of questions. And I don't remember if he smiled or not, but I, I just feel like he smiled when I, when I said that. And he said, Carl, my list of questions is all questions, but your mind is too small to comprehend that. So in order for you to comprehend my list of questions, the answers to all questions, you'll have to become one with me and share my mind. And I thought, his mind is so powerful. What would it do to me? Would it wipe out my personality? I mean, I... I I couldn't think of, could think of all kinds of things that could go wrong with that. Um, but I also felt his love. Mm. And I believed that, that he loved me, that he wanted the best for me. He wouldn't do anything bad. Um, and this was going to be something very good, unprecedented. 
And yes, yes, I want this. I, I have no idea what I'm getting into, but I want this. And I said, yes. And the instant I said, yes, it felt like my being was just sucked into him, into his personality. And the whole scenario there in the house completely disappeared. And the next thing I know, I was one with not just Jesus, but Jesus and the Father God. Mm -hmm. um, they, and words just don't really explain what that's like. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best here. But um, the first thing I realized was my whole personality was still intact. I had all my memories. I had all my personalities. I had my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, just like Carl. But I also was Jesus, and I was also God the Father. Now, the Holy Spirit wasn't there. And later on, that wasn't explained to me, but later on I figured it out that the Holy Spirit is here because when Jesus went there, the Holy Spirit came here, and that's why he's not in heaven at the moment. Anyway, so, and I got, an, and I felt like I've been here before. And this seems like a natural state, a natural environment for me. Um, I didn't have memories of it, but it just felt so right, so normal, that I realized that I was a piece of God. And to create me, to create Carl, he had taken a piece of himself and separated it out. I was aware of everything he was aware of. So in just for a glimpse, I saw everything he was seeing. I experienced everything he was doing, all his thoughts. <clears throat> I saw the scope of everything he's engaged in, and it's amazingly vast. It's infinite. But the mind of God is also infinite. So an infinity is not a difficult concept for God. So I saw an infinite creation. I saw a celestial city. Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, I, my, my lungs are not fully recovered from that accident, I'll tell you that. Yeah, no worries. Plus, I worked in uh, industrial environments for 30, year, 30 plus years, and that's taken us toll, too. Do you mind if I interject something here? Yeah, go ahead. And then you can come and then you can proceed with. So I just find it fascinating and profound how being a curious, engineer minded man, how you had the list of questions. But just like the Bible says that Jesus, he blesses us beyond what we can imagine or think. Mm -hmm. And what he embarks with you is beyond what you can imagine and th or think. And it blessed you more than you would have been blessed if you just asked him your questions, right? This is a textbook example of that, exactly. Mm -hmm. So proceed then with the story. All right. So um, I had a glimpse of things and I saw that uh, the universe is indeed vast. And uh, I understood that there are other worlds with uh, that have life on them that have people and other creatures. Um, so it's a lot going on that's not just on Earth, but Earth is very central to God's plan. Um, even though we're just a, on a little M-class planet in the Milky Way galaxy, which are both quite ordinary on the, uh, the scale of the universe, um, what's happening here is probably the most important thing. And that's, um, I understood that because after that glimpse of the overall uh, scope of things, he this like wall came down around uh, what we were doing and it shut off everything but one subject. And that was the history of mankind. So I got to see the history of mankind from the, not only the creation of the world and in that, the you know, creation of Adam and Eve, but all the way to the very end when the earth and the universe as we know it is destroyed by fire <clears throat> and everything in between. And Christ said, uh, to me, so we're going to look at um, every question in this uh, way. We're going to look at the life of an individual, and each time they make a decision, what is going to be the consequences of that decision? And of course, a person can make multiple decisions at any given point, so we're going to look at each uh, possible permutation of those decisions. So if they turn to right, what happens if they go right? If they go to the left, what happens if they go left? Uh, that's a basic thing. So we looked at, we picked, he just randomly picked out one person's life, and we looked at each decision they made um, and the possible outcomes of it. And uh, I quickly realized something in that when God uh, creates a person, he also creates their possible history. And it's um, an infinite number of different possibilities, 
but it's all bounded. Uh, they can only go so far this way and only so far this way, so far good, so far evil. Um, they can only live so long. They can only, you know, have so many uh, spouses and children. They can only create so many inventions, so forth. So it's, it's carefully bounded. Um, no person's life is ever going to get to a point where it's out of God's control. So everything is very carefully uh, designed <clears throat> so that there is a purpose to the person's life. They have free will. They can make choices, but they can only make choices within um, the boundaries that God sets for them. And then we looked at the person's life, and we looked at the whole course, and I saw, uh, I saw that. And uh, then uh, he took two people's lives and saw how they interacted, how their decisions would affect each other. <clears throat> so the first case was an infinite number of permutations, and that was just, it was like rattling off um, a sentence. It was that easy. And so when we take an infinite number of permutations and we interact them with another infinite number of permutations, that's an infinity times an infinity. And for God, that was like multiplying two times two. And we saw how all their interactions would um, affect each other. And then we looked at how a family would interact. And then we looked how a small community would interact. And then a municipality, then another um, a governmental unit like a a county or a shire or something like that, and then a state, and then a nation. And then the largest unit we looked at was how an empire would interact with the rest of the world. And the whole exercise, subjectively, um, it was many lifetimes worth of information, but it was subjectively about five minutes. And that was amazing. I was just astonished. And some of the takeaways for me from that was that from God's perspective, Everything down here is very well ordered. It has purpose. It has meaning. Um, things just don't happen randomly. They all happen according to a preordained pattern. And what I realized was that God, uh, when he when he basically uh, invented history, he created roles. Okay, history can go in many different ways, but it's all um, defined by the roles that people fill. And these roles are already created beforehand. And these are what you know God refers to as like vessels of wrath. Okay, he doesn't create a person to destroy them. But what really it means is that God has created a role for a vessel of wrath, uh, basically a person to fill the role of a villain. Um, it's not necessary. You don't have to be villains. Um, but when evil does get in, involved, God has to show how evil really evil how evil evil really is so how sinful sin is and so these people fill the role and they show just how bad evil is by filling that role and they choose that role okay so their their decisions their actions basically define what role they fall into uh, and they're also good roles uh, we have you know very good possibilities and a lot of people kind of go back and forth between different roles that so you can you can start in a good role and go bad, or you can start in a bad role and you can go good. Uh, it works both ways, and you can go back and forth your whole life, um, uh, but you really don't want to do that. So, uh, and um, everything is so obvious, and so it, the, from his perspective, looking down on, on Earth, it was like so obvious why uh, all this is being done, and it's all for one thing, and that's to glorify God. The ultimate at, of all of this creation is to give glory to God. So it's all about him. It's really not about us. Yes. Uh, but um, we finished that exercise, and there was like a pause, and it was kind of like Christ was waiting for me to react in a certain way. And I was certainly reacting. I was astonished. I was amazed. I was thrilled. I was, I was treated, but I was treating this like entertainment, and it, it wasn't intended as entertainment. And apparently I, he didn't get what uh, he was looking for because he said, Carl, let's try this from a different perspective. And so we picked another random individual. We started with their life. We looked at the whole of human history from beginning to end. I mean, we looked at the future. We looked at not only every person who had ever lived historically, but everyone who could have lived as well. So this is an infinity times an infinity times an infinity times an infinity. And it was a child's play for God. It was like a mathematician playing with integers. Um, nothing to it. Again, subjectively five minutes. And I came away thrilled and amazed and astonished and just wonder struck by all the things I did. I was learning. 
and I was amassing an incredible amount of information. I saw the details of everybody's life. I mean, everything. Um, and I thought, hmm, this is going to be very useful. Uh, and there was a pause, and Christ was like waiting for a reaction from me, and he didn't get it. Because he said, Carl, let's look at this a third time. And this time there was a tone in his voice or his thought that told me this is getting serious. And that caused me to make a check on myself and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not for my entertainment. Okay, there's a purpose to this, and I'm missing it. And I know that when God offers us uh, something three times, the third time is the last time. Like when Peter was on the roof and he had the vision of the unclean animals coming down for him to kill and eat. Uh, God offered it three times, and then when he rejected it the third time, God just took it away. Uh, there's probably a lot more to that if Peter had just um, received what the Lord had for him, and we may never know what there was. But I was not going to miss that. So I said, this is the third time. I'm Whatever it is he wants me to get, I've got to get. So I paid very close attention. And um, to... Uh, explain a little more in detail how this all worked. There were several things going on uh, simultaneously. And that's one of the things about the mind of God that I learned is that he is capable of handling an infinite number of things simultaneously. Uh, he does not have to focus his attention on one topic, master that, and then move on to the other one. No, he is master of everything all at once. And so while he's showing me these individual lives, the same time, He's also showing me a timeline of human history, and it, it was in this um, it was in this graphical image where each person's life was represented by a thread, and the thread had different colors to it. While the person was alive, um, <clears throat> if they were living a righteous life, it would be white. If they were sinning, it would turn dark. It would if there was a mild sin, and there are different um, levels of sin. Some are just there are some sins which are, the Bible says are not to death and other sins which are to death and some sins which are unforgivable. <clears throat> so uh, the, the color of the thread would indicate the severity of the sin. If it was like beige, it's, you know, that's an everyday sort of thing. You know, white lies and being a little lazy and, um, uh, you know, not doing everything to the nth degree. And then it would get darker, it would turn brownish, then it would turn dark brown. And then if it was really bad it would be black <clears throat> and so when a person died uh, the thread would turn one of two colors they would turn gold if they went to heaven and they would turn red if they went to hell <clears throat> and the threads were organized in bundles so uh, an individual's life is a thread and don't ask me about Siamese twins I don't remember but the if it was a family those threads would be twisted together and then if it was a community, those family threads would, bundles would be twisted together. Communities would be bundled together in municipalities, neighborhoods to the municipalities, then counties, and then states, and then nations, and then empires. And the empires were the biggest, thickest bundles. And these bundles for nations and empires would separate, but sometimes they would come together again. Like, for example, when uh, nations would come together as an alliance, or nations would go to war with each other, or they would have... Um, you know, sometimes whole nations would actually move geographically. And where they would come together, there would be a special thickening of these bundles. I call it a node. And I observed something very interesting in history at those nodes. At those nodes, um, history was very malleable. That is, a uh, few individuals or groups of people who understood the principles of divine order in history could make tremendous impact on history, uh, just change of history dramatically with very little effort. And these notes were sometimes several years broad. So uh, as I was looking at that, I recognized where I was in the timeline. And that was 1995. And the next major node was 1998. And so you'll see that a lot of the tech giants got formed around that time. And they now have tremendous influence on our lives. And I saw that there were other nodes coming up in the future, and I think that we're at one of those points uh, currently right now, <clears throat> uh, a very big one, actually. So then um, that was the timeline I saw, and the very, the most important thing I saw in that timeline was when the end of time, it separated 
the bundles of threads divided into two bundles. Uh, one was the gold threads, they went to heaven, and the other bundle were the red threads, they went to hell. And having worked as a machinist, um, I like to say I've got a calibrated eyeball, <clears throat> and that I can look at some physical object and measure it to within one part in a thousand quite accurately. So I could say <clears throat> quite, quite confidently that measuring those respective bundles, 2.5% uh, plus or minus a tenth of a percent of the general population go to heaven and the other 97.5% uh, go to hell. And when I made that realization, Christ interjected into the um, uh, experience, I'm very disappointed about this. I died so that everyone could go to heaven. Nobody needs to go to hell. And he said, I gave the church everything they needed to win the entire world to salvation from the generation of the apostles till now, and they have all failed horribly. Um, the 2% is really God's remnant. That's the remnant God keeps for himself. And that tells you that the church is failing almost 100%. If you do the math, uh, taking that about a third of the general population are professing Christians. If you do the math, that means that uh, only 8% of professing Christians are actually saved. So if you're in a congregation of 100 people, on average, only eight of those people are actually going to go to heaven. Nobody outside the church is going to make it. Um, there are believers outside the institutional church, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the body of Christ. And I was shocked by that. Absolutely shocked and dismayed. Um, and so uh, we went on, as we were doing that exercise, I was paying very, very close attention to um, the color of the threads and watching that while I was also watching as people's lives were played out in front of me. And I saw as they did things, uh, to change, the threads would change color. And I realized the thread was changing color depending on their motivation. And that was what I had really been uh, meant to see all the time. And I realized that the time when the threads were white, their motive was selfless love. And anytime they had any other motive, the thread would change to another color. And the people who learned the lesson of selfless love and, and, and lived it uh, up until the end, um, you have to you have to maintain your Christian walk right up to the moment of death, and even in some cases afterwards. But uh, as soon as I came to that realization that the answer to the ultimate question was, what does this have to do with selfless love? If you can answer that question, you know the right decision to make. It won't solve your calculus problems, but um, if you have to make a decision and you have a choice between selfless love and something else. The only right answer is selfless love. That has to be the motive for everything you do. That is why God created. It's so important that that's why God not only created the earth and the solar system, but the entire universe. Um, and that should tell you how critical that lesson is. And as soon as I came to that realization, he, Jesus stopped the exercise because I had, I now had what um, I needed to know. And he said, Carl, that's what you need to learn. That's the answer to every question that really matters. What does this have to do with selfless love? And then I felt myself begin to separate from him. And we were coming back to this life. And as we did, um, I could feel my consciousness shrinking. My mind was coming back to its current state. And as it did, this incredible flood of information just began gushing out of me, and I could feel all this information uh, leaving me. And I thought, oh, no, that's really valuable. I, as an engineer, as a, I understand the really the value of good information. I mean, this is all truth. This is all facts. This is all absolutely perfect information, and it was extremely well organized. I mean, Christ's ability to handle information is amazing. It's He's the... Not only is the consummate teacher, uh, he's the consummate archivist. He is so good at organizing information, it would just put all our uh, archival efforts to total shame. Anyway, all this information was gushing out of me, and I said, I've got to keep this. And 
in my spirit, I was just trying to grab onto that information and, and hold on to as much of it as I could. And the thought came from Christ, and it was a gentle thought, but it was very firm. It said, Carl, you don't need that. That's not for you to keep. Let it go. You can't even retain it. And I, I and the next thing I know, I'm standing back in my foyer in my house. Christ is there with me, and um, I'm looking over to the living room, looking at my body on the floor. And ooh, I thought it's about to, time to go, and um, and that was it. I didn't. He didn't have any more to say to me. But I was thinking, oh, wait a minute. Um, I, I, I'm coming back to this life. I've got to raise my children right. How do I do that? How do I get it right? I had so many questions start coming to me and it was like wait a minute um before you go tell me how do i fix this and before i could even frame the thought i felt myself sucked back into my body and <clears throat> next thing i know it's dark again and i open my eyes and they're still full of pus but i don't feel the pain from the burn and um so i, I get up in the dark and i feel my way to the bathroom flip on the light and i turn on the water by touch and then I start splashing water in my face and I rinse my eyes out and then I get a towel and dry off and I open my eyes and I can see and the pus doesn't come back. Mm. Uh, I look at my hand and it's almost completely healed. There was just uh, just one uh, fairly nasty burn still here, uh, but all the other burns were gone. My face was that's normal color again. My eyebrows were still gone and my hair was still singed, but um, the pain was gone in my throat. Uh, and my nose, and I could breathe normally, and I, I was healed. And I thought, I'm alive. I looked at my wet face in the mirror with my hair all messed up, and I thought, it's so good to be alive. Oh, I'm so glad to be back. And then I realized, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I said, I want to eat midnight. So I, I quickly go to the, the, the kitchen, which was next uh, to the living room, and I look up at the first thing I do, I get in the kitchen, I look up at the clock, Five minutes after midnight, I thought, well, I died about midnight. It was about, about six minutes after midnight. And it probably took me about a minute to get to the bathroom and rinse my face off and then get to the kitchen. So that whole experience, chronologically, five minutes maximum. Oh, wow. Unbelievable. To die. <laughs> but no, um, I started fixing a big breakfast there, turned on all the lights, cooked myself my favorite breakfast and scrambled eggs and bacon and, and, uh, and uh, English muffins. And I was eating there and, and then uh, the mother of my children steps into the doorway of the kitchen and she looks at me and she says, Carl, what are you doing? And I said, ah, I'm healed, I, I died. And, and God resurrected me and he healed me and, I, and I'm, well, I'm healed. I can eat again and I'm hungry. So I made my <laughs> breakfast. And she shook her head like, that doesn't make any sense. She said, I'm going back to sleep. Stop making so much noise. And then she went back to bed. I was like, that, that was the first time my testimony got rejected and it was far from the last time. Um, but there, there are a couple, of, a couple of takeaways from this too that I, I want to add as the final epilogue here. Um, what I found out was that the, the the vision in which Jesus used to show me how to heal my body, uh, that activated that gift of healing. And for about the next 18 months, um, the Lord could heal anyone of anything instantaneously through me just by laying on hands and praying for them. So, And to this day, that, act, that gift of healing is still active in me, um, but... It's been compromised uh, different several times, different ways along the way. So it doesn't work nearly as well. And one of the things I learned is that um, I have to use this gift on a daily basis, at least two or three people, or it um, starts to atrophy. So that's why I'm very keen to get as many opportunities as I can to minister healing, because that helps me maintain the gift so it's ready to help others. So that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway was that whenever I came into the presence of somebody else, who had had uh, a near-death experience, I immediately knew that. Um, I had, it was just knowledge that was uh, that came to me, and there was no question about it. And I got some great stories. Now, this is the mid-90s, and near-death experiences were nearly as popular or well understood then as they are now. <clears throat> and so uh, most people who had near-death experiences got a very hostile reaction. Uh, my church, for example, utterly, totally 
rejected that testimony. Uh, and it led eventually to us being literally forced out of that church. But the um, uh, the people I would I, I would sense that they had near death experience or something else equally profound. Um, I would go to them and I'd say, "You have a story to tell." And at first they'd be reluctant, but then I would tell them, "I've had one too. I understand. You can talk to me." And then they would tell me their stories and. I got to hear so many amazing stories. One woman had died twice, went to hell the first time and heaven the second time. Another man had been shot in the head and woke up in the morgue with a behind a nurse and he had asked her to get a doctor and she went out screaming out of the room. Uh, but um, this uh, just amazing. And what I learned from that is that there are a tremendous number of people who've had such experiences that, that you wouldn't believe. Um, I would say just on uh, my informal polling of the general population, it lasted about another about 18 months. Um, was it more than 1%, maybe as high as 2% of the general population have had that kind of an experience? So it's millions of people out there that share this experience. And they, the ones that are listening now um, understand what I'm talking about. So that's... Uh, that's the story. Well, I, what a story it was. And I just felt like, and I'm sure people watching today have also felt that we were in this with you. We, I felt your experience and, and I just want to say how profound it is. And thank you. Where can people find your book? Uh, maybe get in touch with you. So um, uh, I'm on Facebook uh, under Carl Falcon, and I'd be happy for people to contact me there using messenger. Um, and like I said, I would be uh, glad to schedule a session to uh, minister healing to anyone. I don't guarantee that someone's going to get healed, but I have seen many people get healed already. And uh, not only does it help them, it helps me too, because it helps me maintain my gift and it helps me learn new things. I'm learning new techniques uh, all the time as I presented with new problems. And I don't care if uh, you've been to 100 healing ministers and nothing is uh, helped you. Um, I'm willing to give it a try, and I've definitely had some good breakthroughs there. So, um, and if you got multiple things you need healing of, uh, we, we'll address them all at once. There's no, no limit to them. So, uh, do contact me through Facebook. Uh, I'd be happy to answer related questions. I do not like answering personal questions, especially about my family. But if anything, anything about my near death experience, any question on the nature of God or your need for, uh, how you can know you're saved. I'll be very glad to, to share that. Um, my book is available free in PDF format. So I will be happy to share that with you in, in PDF format for free. If you want a hard copy, uh, there's a first edition that's available on eBay under the ultimate question. That's the title of the book. And, and my, and, um, the, uh, uh, the book is also available on my author website. It's www.house, H-O-U-S-E, of, O-F, Yefeth, Y-E-F-E-T-H, dot com, houseofyefeth.com. And on that website, you can download uh, not only the ultimate question free of charge in PDF format. Uh, I have an ebook there. I have some other books I've written. I have other teaching and training materials, including a deliverance manual there. If you read the book, you realize how central deliverance is to walking in uh, Christian faith. Um, and uh, there are other resources available on that website. So those are three different ways you can contact me is my Facebook site. Uh, you can get the book from eBay and you can also uh, download or purchase the hard copy book I even have a second edition now that's available. Um, I'm working towards getting that in print, and I uh, even have a large print uh, option available. So, um, and I want to make this available. The books are sold at cost. Uh, I don't make um, much of a profit at all on this. Uh, I just want to get the, uh, the truth out and help people not only to be sure of their salvation, but to be healed of um, and delivered both. These are both part of that, uh, that ministry that I believe the Lord gave me. 
Wonderful. Thank you again, Carl. And as we close today, I can't help but reflect on the ultimate answer Jesus showed you, which is again, selfless love. What would be the final encouragement you would like to impart with our viewers today? Well, um, in addition to imparting my final word of encouragement, I would like to also uh, minister healing by prayer for the audience. But my um, my my encouragement would be: uh, this is the most important decision you can make, uh, choosing your eternal destiny by choosing Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Um, he's your Savior in that He saves you from hell, but He's also Lord in that He has a plan for your life. It's a very good plan. It's the best possible plan. Uh, but he gives us free will, and you need to obey him to get there. And the only way you can obey him is you need to know what his will is. Uh, that's largely revealed in the scriptures. So you need to understand uh, what his will is as revealed in the scriptures. But you, you'll find that even if you understand that in the head, you need to believe it in your heart, and you can't do that on your own. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to learn to uh, be able to hear his voice, to sense what he wants for you so that you know that you know that you know uh, what God wants of you. And then do that with all your strength. Because um, if you finding the Christian faith easy, you've probably um, been taught wrong. It's, it's, a very, it's, it's impossible. Uh, and, and the scriptures say that, that um, while all things are possible with Christ, we can do nothing without him. Uh, and we can do nothing without him. Uh, as Lord of our life. Yeah, so can you now lead us into a prayer as you feel led in the area of healing? Yes, and I want to preface that with a very brief teaching on the do's and don'ts of healing ministry. And here I'm summarizing what I think is excellent teaching uh, by another minister, Curry Blake. He's the current head of John G. Lake Ministries. Um, which I mentioned John G. Lake earlier in this thing. He's probably uh, one of the best examples of a healing minister that I've found so far. And Curry Blake um, really does a great job of simplifying this. There's only two criteria to be healed. Um, the first is you have to believe that Christ paid for your healing by his wounds uh, for the glory of God. And that means you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't buy it with money. And um, it's really not about you. It is for the glory of God to show how great is his goodness and mercy. The second criteria is you have to receive it. And that's you not only have to believe it with your heart, but you have to receive it as a free gift from God. And you'd be surprised how many people have trouble with that. But that's those are the two criteria, and that's all that's required. But there are a lot of things which interfere with healing. And Curry Blake list two out of the three in his training. The first one is the traditions of men. An example of that is the teaching, and it's a very wrong teaching, where people say, well, um, God has three answers to a prayer for healing. First of all, uh, we don't pray for healing. If you look at all the scriptural examples in the New Testament of when Christ and the apostles healed, they never asked God to heal anyone. Mm -hmm. They never prayed for anyone to heal. They healed. And in my experience, what that is, is when someone is ready to be healed, I feel the power of God come on me, and I simply release the power of God to heal them. And that's really all there is to it. Um, but the, if you, if the fancy way is you say, you say, by your faith we're healed. You declare healing. You say, um, your faith has made you well, or you are healed. So healing is not a petition. It's a declaration. We declare people healed, and we heal them. And that's all there is to it. Um, and what's wrong with the uh, the doctrines, uh, the traditions of men is they say God has three answers. Yes, no, and wait a while. So that's a, another lie of the devil. It's always yes. God always wants to heal. Uh, yeah. He wants to heal you completely. He wants to heal you now. He wants to heal you permanently. And anything less than that is interference from the devil. And that's where the doctrines of demons come in. And a classic uh, example of that is the uh, doc is the teaching that, well, you know, 
God is not able to heal you because the devil's too strong. And they try to illustrate it as a power play between the God and the devil. It's not a power play at all. When Christ came back um, to uh, speak to his disciples, he said, all power and all authority has been given to me on earth. And that means all the power is Christ. The devil has no power. So it's not a contest between power. It's a right. contest between truth and lies. And the devil doesn't have anything. So all it is is truth overcoming lies. And uh, the so um, and that's the truth. God wants to heal us. He wants to heal and us. And we just have to and believe it. Believe that was the second. Believe. Now, one thing that Curry Blake doesn't teach on, and what I found in my experience, this is the third thing that prevents mm -hmm. healing, and that's witchcraft. Um, mm -hmm. A number of the people uh, I ministered to, they obviously believed, they obviously received, and the power came on me to heal them, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't move, it didn't flow. And uh, I learned through revelation from the Holy Spirit that it was witchcraft, and um, I learned how to defeat that. And it's really very simple. It's called a royal declaration. I don't. I think uh, we don't really have time and opportunity to go into that. It's a whole different teaching. But that material is on my website. It's free, and I highly recommend it because it works 100 percent of the time that I use it. It's One other thing too, Carl. Would you say I know in my even my own personal experience when we've been healed. The enemy then wants to come in and say you're not healed, or maybe your symptoms don't go away, but but it's not true. You are healed. So um, Isaiah, when he writes in his book, he says, by his wounds, we are healed, present tense. Uh, I think it's Peter that quotes him, and he says, by his wounds, we were healed. And he used the past tense. So it's already done. Um, so it's already done. We have to believe it, receive it, and that's all it should take. But the devil gets involved there. So if it doesn't, if you're not healed, um, the problem is not with God. The problem is not really with you. Um, the problem is with the healing minister. So when Christ and the disciples healed, everyone that came to him was healed. And it didn't matter if they were a believer or not. In fact, in the New Testament accounts, nobody is a Christian. They're either Jews or Gentiles. So you don't even have to be a Christian to be healed. Um, for example, I trained under Reinhard Bonnke. And an uh, interesting observation in his ministry was uh, Muslims would come to his uh, crusades not because they wanted to become Christians. They just wanted to be healed. And he said the, the, the people who were healed of blindness were mostly Muslims. They came as Muslims. They were Muslims when they were healed of blindness. And they were Muslims when they went back home seeing. They wow. Christians. Um, so you don't even have to be a Christian to be healed. You don't have to be good to be healed. You don't even have to, um, you know, uh, you can be a sinner and be healed, and you can continue in your sins and be healed. It's just amazing. There's only two criterions, believe, receive. But that's where witchcraft comes in, okay? Witchcraft is a lie, and what it does is it um, calls God a liar. It says, you know, God is not able to keep your healing. He's not able to heal you. And uh, people, when they believe those lies, that opens the door for the devil to steal their healing. Mm -hmm. And that's why deliverance ministry is so very important because what I've learned in ministering deliverance is that virtually everybody has demons. They're either about them, on them or in them, and they're oppressing them. And they're stealing away God's blessings. God answers every prayer. Uh, yes, he does. says in the scriptures, if we ask anything according to God's will, we have it. Christ said if we ask anything in his name, he will do it for us. So if we ask anything according to his will, we have it. If we ask anything in Christ's name, he did it for us. Because God cannot lie. He keeps his promises. But if they don't manifest, something's mm. wrong. It's not with God. You will never, ever solve any problem blaming God. He is perfect. He is yeah. holy. He keeps yeah. his promises. He cannot lie. Mm -hmm. Remember that. So right. it's the devil that's doing it. And he, he does it with lies. And he does it because people believe lies. So you've got to figure out what the truth is. And mm -hmm. you've got to enforce the truth. And that's enforced by declaring the promise of God in Scripture. So um, uh, all that's to say that if you're not getting healed, either you or the healing minister has believed some lies. And i got to admit, I'm not perfect. 
Okay, I don't have everything sorted out, but I do have a pretty good grasp on things. So with all that said, I'd like to minister healing, and it's super simple. Um, I'm just going to uh, declare that mm -hmm. one hearing this yes. uh, testimony who believes that Christ paid for their healing by his wounds for the glory of God and receives it is healed for the glory of God. I release the power of God and the angels of God to do this. And I, I will add something else here. Um, I'm going to use authority that I have in Jesus Christ because I'm seated with Christ at the right hand of God. I cancel every demonic assignment against everyone listening here. And I forbid it to be reinstated. And I speak to any demon of infirmity that is causing that sickness. Yes. I, I speak to you, demon, and I say, you look to Jesus Christ. For it says in the word of God that we're two or more gathered. Christ mm -hmm. is there also, and he is here now because he keeps his promise. And I say to you, demon, you look at Christ and you do what he tells you to do. You will replace everything you stole. You will fix everything you broke. You will straighten everything you twisted. You will remove all your filth and everything you planted in this person. And you yes. will and never return, not you or your kind. And I just pray for the people here. They will receive the, 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 the baptism and the indwelling of Holy Spirit to take up every part of their being that these demons have uh, used. And if the person receives the Holy Spirit, he will fill them and never allow that demon in them again. And I just, I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, for the honor and glory of the Father. Amen. Oof, amen.